Chapter 2, 10% gay or 90% non-straight. If you watch TV, which you shouldn't, but if you do, you'll come across the gay debate. Are they born that way or did daddy not take them hunting enough? The, great, the gay rights activist will insist that gays are born that way and thus entitled to rights. The representative of the 14th century will at best admit that perhaps gays have a predisposition, but just like with alcoholism, this ill too can be overcome with plenty of prayer and costly quack reparative therapy. Damnation, no donation, no salvation, to quote the game Grand Theft Auto 2. The meticulous thinker should be skeptical of the gay side's view of the origins of this strange species called the gays because the premise itself is illogical and shaky. Supposed inborn traits do not give rights. On the contrary, every genocide has been started when a detestable minority group was found to have an incorrigible flaw, i.e. they were born that way. The Nazis believed that Jews were born that way and couldn't undo themselves no matter what. Those given to same-sex inclinations could change or at least control their urges enough not to be a public nuisance, so thought these brilliant th so these brilliant thinkers thought. That's why under the Nazi regime, six million Jews died, while perhaps only 6,000 died of those arrested under paragraph 175, the old Prussian law that made sexual acts between males illegal. So why do gays hammer home the point that they were born that way? While logic does not grant rights for inborn traits, the judiciary of the United States has a distinct bias against reason and logic. They think that, quote, groups with such immutable characteristics such as race and sex entitle them to equal protection of the law, end quote. If gays are part of a protected class, they get the rights. Apparently, I have more right to collect coins if I can show that my numismatic urges are congenital rather than acquired in later life. Methinks that's a more limiting view of rights, but a critique of the legal system of our banana republic is outside the scope of this work and we'll have to wait until a forthcoming volume. The cleric shares a conflict of interest with the gays and needs truth bent his way too. He doesn't want gays to have been born that way because it contradicts his view that God created a perfect world. If gays were born that way, their interpretation of the Bible is wrong. Why would God make people who by nature tend not to go forth and multiply? Why would God endow people with desires that they cannot partake in? God cannot be a Hermes. So are gays born that way or not? And more importantly, how do our numerous Greco-Roman colleagues figure into this? Well, given the logical flaws and conflicts of interest, let's instead resurrect a now dormant debate between scientists and historians. Scientists have confirmed that gays are probably born that way, though the exact reasons remain elusive. The main culprits are genes and prenatal hormones. They point to the myriad studies that show that perhaps 2 to 10 percent of the population would be in the catch-all category of lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender, or LGBT, that deviates, quite literally, in development from the heterosexual norm, the vast majority, at the very least, 90 percent. This 90% is an awfully familiar number, but it's also the number of Roman emperors with boyfriends. So what's going on? Why are the homo-hetero numbers inverted for the past if homosexuality is a fixed trait? There may be a few more gays in a culture without homophobia, but science does not expect the 90% figure and thus shrugs it off as an irrelevant blip on the radar of massive contra-evidence. Opposed to these essentialists, some historians, social constructionists, and classicists hint at culture as an overlooked driver of sexuality. They are skeptical of the signs because history shows a great deal more variety of sexuality between men, including dozens of cultures like the Greco-Roman world in the previous chapter. Are scientists making stuff up? Is history? Is all of history a big hoax? There is a way for both seemingly mutually exclusive views to be correct. While both have much to offer, science and history speak mutually unintelligible languages, so their differences have not been reconciled. How does a scientist interpret historical data that rejects everything seen in the lab? How does a historian interpret scientific data 
that rejects everything seen in history. A review of both history and science is needed. Spoiler alert, both are correct as contradictory that may seem.